So this time next month, I'll be a married woman. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's high time for those who know me. Um, in fact, we'll be married for one day this time next month. So we're super excited about that. And um, it's just been amazing to see how God has worked in our lives. So the plan was to get married in 2020. But then <laughs> COVID happened, lockdown happened, unemployment happened. So our plans were delayed by two years. Um, but if I just look at how God has worked in our lives during that time and prepared us, it's been incredible. And I'm just so grateful to also become instant mommy to beautiful twins, Grace and Jessie. Like, I could not be more blessed. <laughs> God has just done full circle restoration in my life, and I'm so grateful for that. And um, it brings me to our theme for this series. And every time we preach a series, I think, oh, that was the best one so far until it's this one, One More Light. And um, if you haven't listened to John's testimony from last week, please go online and listen to it. It was absolutely phenomenal. And the essence of One More Light is that we care about the one. We care about one more person coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that our hearts will break for the lost, that we will move out of this almost lockdown state we found ourselves in, which became very insular to looking out into the world around us. And if I think of how we all were saved. You know, we all have a, spir a spiritual lineage. Somebody told somebody about Jesus who told somebody about Jesus who told somebody about Jesus who told you about Jesus. And it was this concept of how remarkable that is that made me consider my journey. So I want to take my testimony back to 300 years ago. <laughs> there was a man named John Wesley. And he was the father of the Methodist Church that we know today. And um, one of 19 children. And he survived a house fire. Somebody literally plucked him from the fire out the window. And from that day onwards, he felt that God had spared him for a reason. And um, he was thrown out of the popular church of the day for his absolute radical conviction that man is saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. You cannot earn your salvation and good works won't get you into heaven. And so he had to preach in the open air and in open areas um, until later when the Methodist church was established. But the reason why they called them the Methodists, it was actually an insult. But he owned it and embraced it and they became the Methodists was because they were so methodically driven and they would be very disciplined in how many hours they spent in prayer every day and um, working Christian values into their lifestyle. And that was because they lived at a time where there was absolute debauchery, lawlessness, uh, lack of moral society falling apart. And that was why they deemed it necessary to implement this lifestyle. And what was also incredible is he was later known as the man who saved England. And the reason for that is, is because they were so dedicated to reformation and influencing every part of their society, from education to giving factory workers better rights, even animal cruelty they addressed, um, poverty, human rights, all these things they spoke into and fought for, the abolition of slavery. Um, because of that, later on, when there was the European Revolution, England was stable. And that's why they called him the man who saved England. He was so devoted to spreading the gospel. They said in his lifetime, he covered 400,000 kilometers. That's 10 times around the globe on horseback to take the gospel to people. And he was a man of prayer. Every morning he would kneel in prayer and pray for hours. And now we skip forward to the 1940s. And um, I'll later tell you how all of this ties up in my testimony. And there was a man called Professor Orr, and he was uh, teaching at a seminary, and he decided to take his theological students on a road trip, or a field trip. And they would visit all these profound places of interest, of what had helped shape religion and their beliefs, and who were these great ref reformists. And of course, they went to John Wesley's house as one of the places in Epworth in England. And all the students walked into the house and marveled at this is where he had breakfast in the morning. They could see the kitchen table. And they'd walk on and here's his study and his notebooks and his old notes and the books he studied. And they walked up later up the stairs to his little bedroom. 
and filed past the bed <laughs> in line to make space for everybody to fit. And one of the students noticed in the carpet next to the bed were these two worn out hollows. And they asked the professor about it, and it said that was the place where John Wesley's knees used to rest in prayer every morning as he prayed for hours, for the lost, for revival, for reformation, for the world around him to be impacted for Jesus Christ. And they couldn't believe that the carpet was actually worn through there. And they all filed back to the bus, and Professor ordered his head count to make sure that everybody was there, but a student was missing, one student was missing. And he went back up, he's not in the kitchen, he's not in the study, up the stairs. And here kneeling next to the bed, with his knees in those exact two spots, was one student. And he was praying fervently and he said, God, do it again. Just do it again, Lord. <laughs> and will you do it with me? That man was Billy Graham. Something of John Wesley's life captured Billy Graham's heart. And we know that Billy Graham went on to reach approximately 2.2 billion people. He visited 185 countries in his lifetime preaching the gospel. A man known as a, as a dynamic, wonderful evangelist and also a man of prayer. And um, just some other interesting facts about Billy Graham that I wanted to share with you. About 3.2 million recorded salvations from his crusades were recorded. And he preached the gospel to 210 million people in person at his crusades. Like nobody else in history, in Christian history, has been able to do that. And it was also because of Billy Graham's devotion to prayer and revival. When I was a little girl of six years old, oh, Billy Graham came to South Africa in 1973. I don't know if you guys knew that. He was invited a number of times, um, but because he insisted on a multiracial gathering at the time, and they would not agree to it, he could not come. And then finally, in 1973, they agreed to it. And he preached the gospel to 100,000 people in South Africa who gathered at the Wanderers Stadium. It was the biggest multiracial crowd that had ever been seen in our country, and it was even a work of God that it was allowed, and I believe the birth for um, the, the putting apartheid away and behind us and for the healing of our nation and embracing diversity came from that gathering in 1973 in our country. And forward another 12 years, I'm a little six-year-old girl sitting in my lounge, and I'm watching a Billy Graham crusade on TV. <laughs> What was remarkable is I was Afrikaans and raised in an Afrikaans home. He preached in English, but I understood. Alone in my lounge, watching a little black and white TV. And I went outside and I wrote the date on a leaf, <laughs> like one does, <laughs> when you become saved. <laughs> and I stuck it in a little crack in the wall next to the swimming pool. And I knew from that day onwards that God was real and that I belonged to him. That was what I understood. And only years later, when I was 18, I was in a small Methodist church in Secunda, part of John Wesley's heritage. And I felt the fire of God on me as he called me. My palms were burning like fire, and I, was, I felt like I was pulled out of my chair. And I answered the call of God in my life. And um, next year, I went to Rosebank Bible College to study theology, and that's how my journey began. But apart from that incredible salvation story, where I knew God's hand was upon my life, and knowing that, you know, because of the faithfulness and prayer of, of that man, I always had carried this passion for revival in my heart and dreaming of seeing a revival in my lifetime. Where God's heart, God just washes and drenches people in him and in his spirit. Where nobody has to even stand up and preach. Where the unsaved just flocks in, saying we need to make right with God, we need Jesus our savior where people are healed on the spot, where their lives are changed, where society is reformed. If we look at the revivals in history, you know, the prisons were empty. They didn't have to have courts anymore. There was no need for judges. Like, can you imagine that? And then exactly 100 years ago in our country, Grahamstown was in revival in 1922. 
can we say, God, will you do it again? <laughs> Imagine us praying and Graham Stan experiencing that kind of revival again and it's spreading like wildfire. And that we can be part of that in our generation, in our lifetime. So part of my testimony that I felt of, like sharing today was how I was healed. And so after studying theology, I had all this head knowledge of God and um, I loved him and loved going to church, pursued him. But there was a part missing, and that is understanding and knowing the Father heart of God for me. That was my void. Believing that his promises and his heart to love, to protect, to heal, to care for, was for me as well as everybody else. And um, I struggled with my health for many years. Uh, I had a skin condition, I had asthma, I was using my asthma pump 22 to 28 times a day. Um, my skin would flare up, they said it was food allergies at the time. My skin would flare up, blood red, and then peel for two days and the cycle would just repeat, repeat. I would feel like I'd been hit by a bus constantly, having no energy and trying to work and live a full life at the same time. And all they did was prescribe huge doses of cortisone. So for anybody who's been on cortisone <laughs> and had prolonged cortisone treatment, <laughs> um, you know that it puts your body in this fight-flight mode. So that's how I lived. I went from having, being fearful and having panic attacks to wanting to jump out of a car if the music is too loud, to feeling like I could throw a car through a wall, like having the strength of Godzilla as that cortisone would spike because it's a steroid. Um, so life was really difficult, and um, my time in hospital became more and more frequent. I was always taken up into emergency units, put on a cortisone drip, and without me knowing, the cortisone just made the condition worse, but it brought relief for the time. And um, because everybody said it was food allergies, I started eating less and less and less, so eventually you could blow me over. <laughs> I weighed almost nothing. <laughs> and, um, and then also what was so peculiar for me is Apart from these allergies increasing, one day I could even eat an avocado peel and be absolutely fine. The next day I would eat that same item of food and I'd end up in hospital. So of course people started telling me it's psychosomatic. So now on top of being sick, I have to deal with the fact that people think I'm just crazy. <laughs> and it comes with all the stigma, you know, and it was, yeah, people close to me, friends, church people, not understanding, nobody understood what was going on with me. And um, eventually I knew I could not carry on that way. I was dying, my body was shutting down. They would phone me in and say, you're on the verge of multiple organ failure, but I didn't know why. Nobody could tell me why I was dying. And it reached a point where one New Year's Eve, I was hospitalized again, and I was lying next to a lady who tried to commit suicide. And I looked and I thought, but your skin is perfect, you're healthy. Why? <laughs> Why on earth would you try and kill yourself? <laughs> like, can we just do a body swap quickly? <laughs> it was such an odd thought to have. Um, but I went home, and for the first time in a year, so just know beforehand, I tried every formula there was. I threw medication away in faith. I did everything from rosemary baths to you name it, everybody's advice, everybody I tried it all. I spent more money on medicine than I did on food. I saw every specialist at a certain unnamed hospital that there is. <laughs> and nobody could tell me what was wrong with me. And um, leaving that night on that New Year's Eve, I went home and for the first time, I threw all the formulas away and I looked to the healer. And God in the next two months started revealing himself to me as a father. I never knew that was a missing link to my healing. I could never even put the two together. But he wanted me to know that he cares for me, that he loves me, that he wants to protect me, that he wants to provide for me, that I matter, that he sees me. And it was a two month journey of revelations of that throughout the day pictures and seeing it in people, seeing men being good fathers to their children suddenly spoke to my heart. Um, certain things that I almost, you know, when you see, we see it on a movie like a father embracing a child and I would melt down and cry, suddenly brought joy and brought healing when I saw that. 
And during this journey, I Googled again. Google is how I found this church, so Nadine loves Googling. <laughs> Googled again, more doctors, more specialists, and I found a man who lived in Cape Town, and he came out to Joburg every second month. He was retired, um, but uh, a dermatologist, the general ma <laughs> a GP, like you name it, the medical credentials, he had it, and an allergy expert. And he came to Johannesburg, and I went to see him. And as I sat in his room, he said to me, you don't have allergies, I'll prove it to you. And I broke down, I sobbed in his room because for the first time I heard truth. For the first time I heard something that resonated with me and the condition was actually called histamine intolerance. So as histamine built up in my body, the reaction would become more severe. If it was below a threshold, I was fine. Which is why one day I can eat a strawberry and be fine and the next day I eat a strawberry and I die. <laughs> And he explained all of this to me and how it worked and what I had to do. And within three weeks, I was perfectly well. I remember eating an egg for the first time again and sobbing. My diet had literally before consisted of chicken without any spices on, lettuce, leaves, and future life. That's all I ate or could eat. And yeah, I was eating these things and I was absolutely fine. And he explained to me how the cortisone was destroying the enzymes that break down histamine in your body and the long story, but still, my healing came through a medical expert, and you know, sometimes God heals supernaturally on the spot, he touches us and our bodies are healed. Other times he uses doctors and the medical experts and fraternities to bring healing to our lives. And I knew that that was an act of God. I knew that was the hand of God working. And that he did this work that he brought to completion in my life through healing. And there are still some times when I struggle with allergies, real allergies, dogs, cats, horses. This year, New Year, I was in the emergency room again because of dogs. <laughs> I love them so much, but somehow they make me stop breathing. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's more healing to come in that area, definitely. But at least I don't have to take leave from work anymore because people think I got sunburned, you know, and like <laughs> would draw their breath in when they see me in shock and horror. Um, and also what was amazing for me after this journey with realizing God is as my father, it changed my personality. I used to be very shy and introverted. My world became very small, obviously, especially if people think you're crazy. Um, I also realized that being ill like that and living with that stigma, you somehow become a, a magnet for instability and unstable things. I was stalked <laughs> by people. In church, I used to hide in bathroom during church services so that people can find me, people sitting outside my house in their cars watching my every move. So, um, you know, with that came also a lot of even feeling more like a freak. <laughs> and that was what I struggled with also during this time. And um, for those of you who, you know, also feel that thing of the stigma that's attached to whatever the thing is that you need breakthrough for, can I ask you to take courage and take hope again today? That he is a God who heals. So my scripture for today is from John 5, and I'd love us to turn there. And it's about healing. John 5 is 1. Everybody there, let's read. I'm reading from the ESV for those who want to change the settings of the translation. <laughs> the healing at the pool on the Sabbath. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, and in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? It's a strange thing to ask somebody who's sick, eh? Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. He was pointing to the formula. 
Like, God, there's a formula, the water gets stirred, and that's when I go in, and that's how I'll find my healing. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and he walked. And we read later on the chapter that the Jewish scholars of the day were furious at Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath. So they asked him, who healed you? Because they were concerned with who broke the Sabbath. Whereas this man was concerned with, who healed me? Jesus healed him. Imagine being there with your affliction or your brokenness, whether it's finances, whatever you need a breakthrough for, and maybe it's been going on for 38 years or more. And Jesus saying, what do you want? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be set free? See, I don't know what it's like to be hopeful and hopeless at the same time. When hope deferred has got you to that place where you just believe I'll never be free from this. You want to, but it's hard to believe it for yourself. But Jesus, <laughs> he steps in. He looks us square in the face and he makes that connection one-on-one -on -one with us. And I know why I've reduced it down to a formula eventually. In my own stupidity, I was trying to save Jesus the embarrassment for not healing me and not realizing it's about relationship. I thought if I pretend that you didn't have a hand in it, Lord, then, then I can make it about me and what I'm doing and my formulas and my processes and how do I heal myself and fix myself and which diet and which doctor and which... And God was calling me to come face to face with him. And I think he knew I will have no impact in being part of praying for, seeing a revival in my lifetime unless I knew him as a father. Unless I understood that part that was missing for me. And for all of us, when there's obstacles, there's a part missing. That's why it's your thing. That's why you're struggling with that thing. There's a part of God's heart for you that you haven't touched on yet and that you don't know yet for you. The verse that became my go-to verse during this time and what I declared, that's so beautiful. It went from being a formula to becoming a reality for me. It's Psalm 103, and I'd like you to turn there as well, please. Psalm 103, verse one. Some of you may know it very well. <laughs> it says this. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And my prayer today is that this verse will go to your hearts, <laughs> that it will go from being a formula that you speak of yourself to to going straight to your heart and become a reality in your life. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to pray for us. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, we worship you. Thank you for the men and the women who went before us. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here today. For the people who took the time to tell us about you, to tell us that there's a Father in heaven who loves us, who sent his Son. And if we believe and receive him, we have eternal life and we are made right with the Father. And God, I pray today for every person who's facing an obstacle, be it healing, financial, anything else, where they feel like they just cannot break this, where they feel hopeless like the man of Bethesda was lying next to the pool waiting for the water to be stirred. Jesus, I pray that you come today and meet with him face to face. I pray for healing power, for your breakthrough to flow through their lives, Lord God. For you to fill them with your love and for a new revelation of what it is to call the God of the universe our Father, our Daddy, the one who cares and loves and protects. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you sow your seeds for revival in our hearts today. Where it's not about good Christians becoming better, but it's about dry bones, fossilized bones, turning into an army. 
the dead coming to life. Lord, will you raise us up as a church with you as the center. And may revival come to your city through the people in this church, Lord God, with each one of us going out there and being a vessel of your love. We ask that in your precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You might be asking yourself the question, how can I take this further? Firstly, you can send us your contact details to cindy at centerchurch.co.za where we can include you in our online connect groups and you can receive our daily devotional. Secondly, you can hop on our website where you can access previous sermons and find out more about who we are at Centre Church. Thirdly, if you consider yourself as part of Centre Church, we want to thank you so much for your ongoing financial partnership. The banking details are on the website. Thank you so much for joining us and hope you have an amazing Sunday.